this is to prepare you for any disasters that should arise in the future. I know some of us are stunned when we had a few here not too long ago. So we have two presenters today uh, from our National Guard. Uh, Lieutenant Alvarez and Lieutenant Dosa. How are you? They both can share the presentation. And I'm sure you're going to be uh, uh, learned or learned by the time you leave here today. So we thank, thank you that you're here. Let me just say a short prayer and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to learn. I thank you, uh, Lieutenant Alvarez and Lieutenant Tosa. And Lord, I pray that you bless them as they present. And bless us so we learn. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, so my name is Lieutenant Jennifer Alvarez. I've been in the National Guard going on six years now. Um, so I was around when Hurricane Sandy hit. Um, a little bit about myself, I am a medical service corps officer. I was a medic before, um, but this thing is near and dear to my heart. Um, I did do, I did get activated during Hurricane Sandy. We did a lot of evacuation missions, a lot of uh, food distributions uh, to the different areas hit. I was mostly in the Rockaways. Um, and if everyone saw the news, we saw how badly that area got hit, as, long, as well as Long Island. Long Island, especially the South Shore over here, um, got devastated. So uh, we're going to talk about pretty much what to do, how to prepare during, before, and after an event. So this is who we are, the Citizen Preparedness Corps, and uh, we're going to get started. So I'm going to be doing part one, and Lieutenant Dosa is going to follow up and do part two. All right, so these are our course objectives. We're going to talk about the different types of disasters. Uh, you're going to know how to respond to these. Um, know how to better sustain yourself and your families. Um, so this is a course agenda. We don't really do a break because it, it's pretty quick. It goes pretty quick. Uh, and then we do have a cute question and answer portion at the end. So all your questions, whatever you have, just ask. I ask that you guys hold them until the end. And uh, now is a good time to silence your cell phones, put them on vibrate. Um, all right, so in 2014, in the state of the state, uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo, this is his program, he realized how uh, New Yorkers were not prepared for natural disasters. They were not prepared to, with what happened. Uh, everybody kind of saw Sandy as like a, like a fluke. They thought it was going to be similar to what happened with Irene. Irene didn't really affect us um, and it was hyped up so much that when Sandy came, they're like, oh, it's just going to pass, nothing's going to happen. And it was actually one of the most disastrous storms that we've ever had in the history of New York. So he created the Citizen Preparedness Corps so that everybody in the state of New York can be well informed as to how to prepare and how to be proactive instead of reactive to a situation. So we have three types of potential disasters in the state of New York. You have your natural disasters, man-made, and technological. Alright, so your natural disasters. These things are anything from hurricanes, uh, tropical storms, super storms like Sandy. Um, Flooding, which is a huge one, uh, especially out here in Long Island, anywhere near water. Um, earthquakes, you know, we just had a huge earthquake that happened in Ecuador. Um, I know it's not here, but, you know, people have family members that are possibly there. Japan, um, but mainly the ones that we need to focus on living here in New York are snowstorms, um, flooding, hurricanes. Right now, May 1st starts today, it's kicking off hurricane season, so if anybody knows, Hurricane season starts pretty much today and goes all the way up until November. <coughs> uh, 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 Sandy hit October 29th, 2012, pretty much at the end of hurricane season, and uh, we saw how bad that was. Um, so these are just, like I said, some of the natural hazards that we have to deal with. Now you have your man-made disasters. The um, uh, biggest one here, especially living in New York, is obviously number one, terrorism. But you also have things like structural collapses, We've had buildings collapse in Manhattan, we have buildings collapse out here in uh, Long Island and boroughs, um, and transportation accidents. Most recently there was um, a derailment on the Hudson Line, uh, uh, Metro North that derailed, killed many people. So all this is, is possible, so just knowing what you and your family members can do to prepare for this, um, and dam failures as well. Now, technological disasters. Um, Everybody here remember the 2003 power outage that happened? 
right? So it wiped out the whole grid for quite a few number of hours. Uh, that's something that can still happen today, and especially now in this new uh, cyber technology age, uh, where everybody's relying on cell phones, everybody relies on everything electrical. Uh, imagine a, a power outage of that magnitude happening in this state in 2016. It'd probably be even more um, catastrophic than the one in 2003, which, you know, back then we weren't as uh, technologically savvy as we are today. Uh, but a big thing also that we worry about is communication failures. What happens if, you know, your cell phones all drop? Well, does anybody have landlines? Many people, I know myself, some people do, which is good because you know you get your um, your uh, three-in-one package deal from Fios or Time Warner or Comcast. You know they sell you on that landline, and that's the only reason you have one. Uh, but you know if you're like me that who doesn't have cable, I don't need a landline. So, but just knowing things, um, and especially if you have kids, every teenager or even kids at starting at the age of seven have cell phones. So. <laughs> Uh, just knowing what you need to do in case you, do, you, know, you don't have any access to cell phones. So um, every year the Department of Homeland Security does an annual risk assessment to see what's the risk uh, of a disaster happening in each state. So in most states, you know, the risk is kind of low, uh, nothing major really happening. Then you have your larger, more populated states like Texas, um, California. Uh, states like that, the, obviously the risk gets a little more elevated. And then you have Washington, D.C., it's even a little bit more elevated, obviously because you have the nation's capital, you have the president there, you have Congress, you have all everything that's making our business function. And then the last one is New York. So this isn't to scare you or anything, but the state of New York as a whole, not just New York City, uh, because of Times Square and the, you know Wall Street, but just overall, our state is huge, uh, we have a very a high risk of snowstorms, flooding, um, especially Long Island. So that's why we're having this presentation so that you can all be aware of what to do in case something happens. So it's important to understand what kind of disasters are going to affect yourselves, your family, and your community. And that's why it's important to know what disasters affect us here in New York. So the course overview, right now we're going to be talking about how to prepare and respond. And the second portion is recover. So part one, prepare. So in the event of a disaster, a lot of resources might not be readily available. So what are you going to do? And this is what we're going to talk about. Some uh, advanced planning is what's going to make you go a long way. And it's going to help you be, like I said, proactive instead of reactive. So preparing from now before you know another storm hits. So being prepared takes three simple steps. You want to develop a family emergency plan, you want to stock up on emergency supplies, and you want to know what to do and how to be aware before, during, and after an event. Okay. So how to develop a family emergency plan? Main thing you want to do is you want to meet with your family members. Everybody needs to know exactly what the plan is going to be. So you want to be able to prepare with your, with your family members, especially if you have children, especially if you have um, older adults in the home, everybody needs to be on the same page as to where you're going to go if something happens. And you want to talk about different disasters, uh, especially letting younger kids know, like, hey, this, because a kid might look at the news and be like, well, when's the next earthquake that's going to happen here? Obviously, we're not as in the um, seismic area as the West Coast, but it might happen. But you want to let them know we're more prone to hurricanes or flooding or uh, snowstorms. Uh, so you want to talk to your kids about that. And then you want to pick two places to meet. You want to have one place that's just outside your home. So maybe if you live across a church, or like in this case, if you live by a church, or if you live uh, by a park, you want to, if you need to evacuate your home for whatever reason, fire, etc., pick a place to go right outside, kind of like a fire drill. And then you want to pick a place outside of your neighborhood. Because let's say it's a disaster that affects a bigger that's in a bigger scale, you want to have a place outside of your immediate neighborhood to meet. So everybody knows, okay, let's meet at the Starbucks that's on the corner of this street. So everybody knows where to go. Now, you want to also have an emergency communication plan. The first thing I said before was everybody has a cell phone. Everybody has some form of communicating. People have landlines. But if those things go down, what are you going to use? Pigeon, or you can use, you know, things of that nature. So you want to be able to have a plan. And one thing that I recommend is having an out-of-town relative. So if you have 
a relative, let's say, upstate in Westchester that's not being affected or somewhere in Connecticut, um, having that person be like the motherboard um, to contact, everybody contacts this relative because, you know, maybe your family members are scattered. Maybe you have your son who works in Manhattan or goes to school in Manhattan and you're out here in Suffolk or, uh, you know, your husband's here, your wife is there, your grandparent, etc. So you want to have everybody contact this one out-of-town relative in case you have no service or you have no access or power in your home. So that person, that, that way that person can track everybody and be like, okay, Jimmy's safe, Johnny's safe, Susan's safe, etc. And know your escape routes, know your evacuation zones. And also if you have pets, make sure you start planning ahead of time on what you're going to do because you have to take them with you. Alright, now there's many um, plans that exist. Um, schools, churches, workplace, daycare centers if you have young kids, uh, senior centers, and your babysitter. Your babysitter should know in case there's an emergency while you're away and they're taking care of your kids, what to do um, for whatever reason. So just make sure um, after this presentation, talk to your schools, talk to your children's schools, your workplace, you know, ask your boss, hey, what kind of plan do we have in the set in case there's an emergency? Um, and it's a great tool to get people talking, great way to get people talking about these types of things. And you can get more information. Uh, there's a lot of volunteer opportunities in your community that you can reach out to. CERT um, is a community emergency response team, so you can look up CERT online and they do volunteer, uh, volunteer work where they kind of do kind of like what I'm doing, uh, but in, in a local community level. Uh, then you have your volunteer fire and EMS, uh, your faith based volunteer organizations, so like any organizations here at church, uh, Salvation Army, Red Cross. Now, to be, be aware, so in here at Alert, I actually have this uh, app. It's an app you can, you can go online and you can register via text message. This thing can give you alerts on traffic, like immediate alerts. Like it'll tell you, you know, Southern State Parkway has two lanes closed since this time, and it'll keep alerting you like every few minutes, if you so choose to. Uh, have that set up, but it's a great tool to have. Uh, it's subscription based. You can pretty much check off what you want to be done. If you want to get oh, Amber alerts, if you want to get, um, if you want to get, like I said, the traffic alerts, if you want to get uh, weather alerts, uh, it's a little more in debt. I know, like my iPhone sends me um, like push notifications that tells me if it's an Amber alert or if it's like a flash flood warning. This is very similar, but this is on all the time. So you know, if it's like a bad day out, it'll tell you X Y Z. Um, you can go on yourpalert.gov, it's completely free and you just sign on. Uh, you put your phone number in and your information and it gives you... Um, and this, this started up shortly after Sandy. Uh, you also have warning sirens. I know in Long Island a lot of the fire and volunteer EMS agencies use a lot of these, like warning sirens or, uh, to alert the fire department that something's going on. Very similar, a lot of Areas also near nuclear plants do the same thing. So just knowing what's in your neighborhood uh, to notify you of different uh, hazards. Now you have your emergency alert system. This is that you're watching your television, you're watching your favorite show, and all of a sudden something starts, starts beeping, uh, and then it starts scrolling at the bottom, giving you an emergency alert. This is what is the emergency alert system. Uh, it goes through your, your TV, it goes through your radios, um, just make sure you're paying attention, especially during a time of like hurricane season or a, a time when you know there's a storm coming. They put out some great information on here. And the NOAA radio. Anybody here own a NOAA radio or ever heard of a NOAA radio? Okay, I see. Okay, so it's um, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Association uh, radio. That's what NOAA stands for. It's um, it's commercially available. You can buy it at a Walmart, a Target. Uh, you can pretty much find it anywhere in like camping areas, like the camping section. Um, it's a pretty neat, nifty little gadget. I've seen one. It's about this small. It's like a cube. Um, it looks like a, just a little portable radio. But the cool thing about this is that it's crank operated, so you can plug it in or you can use batteries for it. But if, if you have no power, there's no electricity, you can actually operate it using a crank. And now the new most up-to-date ones have um, USB capabilities so you can charge your devices on it. And the thing with this, it gives you like right now time information on any weather alerts of what's going on. So like let's say there's a hurricane rolling through and it knocks out all your power with the radio, you can know 
what's the pattern of the storm, where it's at. So it's just another good tool to have, and it's great uh, for extra, um, like I said, energy, so that because you can crank, use the crank. It's usually about sixty bucks. You can get it, like I said, any of these big uh, department stores. I've seen some are obviously more expensive, but they have more. But you can get a relatively uh, cheap one for around sixty dollars. Now, wireless emergency alerts. I mentioned this before. My iPhone seven says most most um, phones now should have it. Um, it's actually a law that went through that the providers are supposed to. Uh, inform you if they don't provide it, then they have to give you a writing. Why not? But AT&T, Sprint, Verizon, T-Mobile, every carrier should have it. Each phone typically tells you, and you'll hear it. It just starts. Even if your phone is on silent, you'll hear like a, a obnoxious little sound, and it tells you like flash flood warning in your area or Amber Alert in your area. So pretty cool to have, and it's also another way to stay alert and aware of, of emergencies. So getting involved, this is another thing. If you don't volunteer, um, or if you're looking to volunteer, this is very, it's a great thing to do. Um, and it's also, um, during a time of, of you know, emergencies, not everybody's gonna be able to help themselves. Maybe you have somebody that can't even move or, or, or walk easily. Just remember, just remember that not everybody's in a position to take care of themselves. So you wanna keep an eye, on, not just on your family, but also on your friends and neighbors. Because it starts with you and your family, your neighborhood, and your community. And this is what we call our circle of life here. So preparing your home and family for a disaster. So fire safety. A big thing that I tell people, anybody here watch the show Hoarders? Hoarders? Okay. <laughs> so this up here, you can see it. It's, you can't even like see where the, well you can see part of the wall. But it's just an insane amount of just clutter. And it's fine, you know, I have my messages, people have their methods, their organized chaos, which is what I like to call it. Um, but just make sure it's organized and it's not preventing you from, you know, reaching an exit or it's not preventing you from leaving. Because a lot of times there's been fires and because people, fire department can't get in through the clutter that you have. Unfortunately, people haven't been able to be rescued or saved. So you want to limit the amount of stuff that you have in your home and you want to also limit the amount of combustible materials that you have. So. It's fine if you have any generators that use gas to have extra gas tanks at home um, in case of, you know, the uh, fuel pumps, like the uh, gas stations running out of gas. That's understandable, but try to limit it to maybe two or three, not five, six, seven, because you want to limit the amount of combustible materials that you have at home to prevent a further explosion or, or whatever the case is. And along with that, everybody here needs to make sure that not, you're not just installing your smoke detectors, but you're testing them every few months. A good rule of thumb for that is you want to change your battery and you want to test it every daylight savings time. So every time you change your clocks in the spring and in the fall, test, your, test the batteries. You know, there's a, each smoke detector usually has a little button that you press. If it presses, if you press it and it sounds like a screeching dying cat, probably time to change, change, the, change the battery. So, so that way you never forget, just when you change, change your clocks, you want to change your batteries in your, in your smoke detectors. Now, a fire extinguisher is very important. I know not everybody has one, but if you do have one, you want to make sure that it's the right one. So we have three classifiers. Uh, we have class A, which is your ordinary combustibles, so your wood, your paper, cloth, things that pretty much produce ash. Then you have your class B fires, which are your flammable liquids. You, it's like your gas fires, your kitchen fires, grease, oil. And then you have your class C fires, which is all your electrical fires, your electrical equipment, your televisions, your appliances. So just a question out there, which one of, or out of these three fires, which one can water put out? Class A, right? Exactly. So class A is the only fire that water can put out. So pretty much, you can't throw water on any kitchen fires, you can't throw water, obviously, on any electrical appliances. So this is why it's so important to have a fire extinguisher that covers all three. So the ABC extinguisher, right here classification, is actually the most common. So if you do go uh, to a store and go and purchase a fire extinguisher, just make sure that it has all three. And you're, you'll be covered to uh, put out any of those three fires. 
And if you do have one at home, just go home and check. And it should most likely say ABC because that's the most common one. But if it doesn't, then I would suggest you go and get one that is able to cover all three. So carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is known as a silent killer, silent deadly killer. It's the reason being is it's a it's a silent it's a a, a gas. You can't see it. You can smell it. Like you can kind of smell like uh, it smells like rotten eggs a little bit. But by the time you smell the rotten eggs, you it's too late. So big thing with that is you want to eliminate the sources that produce the carbon monoxide. So if you have any generators or any space heaters, you want to make sure that they're properly ventilated. And you don't want to operate your generators indoors. Generators should ma mainly be kept outdoors. And you want to check to see that your furnaces or your boilers are not damaged. So you want to periodically check up on them. And uh, your portable heaters, don't just throw them in a corner and put a bunch of stuff on top of them. Just make sure that they're properly ventilated. Because any of these activities can cause carbon monoxide poisoning. At every dwelling since 2010, it's actually a New York State law that you're required to have cut carbon monoxide detectors in your home. So if you if you live in, in a home and you don't own any, by law you're supposed to have them installed. Um, and if you live in, a, in an apartment building that you rent and your uh, your landlord hasn't provided you with carbon monoxide detectors, you can literally look up the law and be like, excuse me, this is for my safety and for your safety we need these carbon monoxide detectors in installed. And when you are installing them, a good rule of thumb for that is keeping them not as high as um, a smoke detector because the thing with carbon monoxide, it's a heavy gas, so it stays lower to the ground. So most, most carbon monoxide detectors are actually found lower on the, on the actual side of the walls instead of on top of the roof. All right, so utilities. Um, before you turn off any utilities, you want to make sure you have the proper tools to do so. So if you need to, if you need a, a specific screwdriver or a specific wrench or plier, you want to make sure you have that because the last thing you want to do is turn something off and damage it in the process and then not be able to turn it back on. So make sure you have the right tools that you need necessary to, before you start turning appliances off. And a big warning, and you'll see this probably two or three more times if I'm not mistaken in the presentation, is once you've turned off an appliance, or um, uh, any gas, electric, or uh, water connection, don't turn it back on until it's been properly inspected by a professional because you don't know if it's sustained any damage during an event. Um, so don't go turning it on. Okay, so turning off electrical. So the next few slides are going to explain briefly or show you briefly if you've never done this before on how to turn off certain appliances, certain <laughs> utilities. So most newer dwellings now have main breaker systems in which this top one right here, you shut it off and it shuts off everything. Um, I mean, if you have your specific breakers that you need to switch, these guys are it. But usually the main one is at the top. And then older dwellings or apartment buildings might have main fuses. Um, same, same concept, you just got to make sure if you are going to be shutting off and unscrewing fuses, you have extra fuses on hand because once they burn off, you need to replace them. So you don't want to have to, you know, burn them off and then not have any spare ones. So just try to keep those spare if you do. So it's a good thing to check to see which ones you have. Uh, fuel gas, same thing. Um, outdoors, the gas valve at the meter um, and the gas valve indoors. Usually you'll see a little knob that you go pull up and down. So a uh, good way to look at this to see how what's turned on and off. The gas is on when the little handle is parallel to the bar. So just remember that because I'm going to quiz you guys in a second on that method, okay? So when it's uh, perpendicular like this, it's off, and then when it's parallel to the bar, it's on. Uh, fuel gas, you think this is if you're living in an apartment building. Most of the time, this is done by your super or whoever's in charge of the building, so you don't really need to be going in and turning off everyone's um, gas valves. Um, but if you do have any propane cylinders, just remember righty tighty lefty loosey is pretty simple. To remember that. Uh, if you have fuel oil, same thing, just know, or kerosene, just know which way um, it's right, tight, left, and loose, you can turn off both the oil and kerosene. Water supply, the same thing. Uh, curbside water valve, you see this a lot out here um, in, on the island, um, just knowing how to turn that off. And then the inside water valve. So right here, this, you got the pipe and you have the handle. Is this on or is this off? Oh. Good. 
not really a quiz, but I said have a quiz you guys. So good. Just knowing that how to turn all these things off. Same warning, just don't turn off uh, turn on any of these utilities back on until they've been properly inspected and approved by a professional. So homeowners and renters insurance. Anybody here have homeowners and renters insurance? Okay, you have a few. Um, I have some myself, I have renters insurance. Just know what's covered and what isn't covered. Um, does your homeowner's insurance, does it cover flooding? Yeah. No, okay. Most homeowners or renters insurance, and they don't tell you this, does not cover flooding. So flood insurance is a whole separate insurance. And so a lot of times what's happened is people uh, get flooded and they immediately call their insurance company and say, hey, my apartment's been flooded, my home's been flooded. And they're like, oh, well, you know, you failed to get the premium for the flood insurance, so we can't cover it. So just make sure you go, if you do have that insurance, you go and check to see what's covered and what isn't. And most of it does not cover flood damage, so you have to get your own flood insurance. And just make sure you have uh, photographic evidence of damages. So take pictures of your stuff before they get ruined. So have pictures of all your important stuff and then um, uh, like a before and after shot of things. Okay, so this is the second part is how to stock up on emergency supplies. So you want to be prepared to stay, um, to make it on your own for seven or ten days. That's just a, like what we give you guys to work with um, to start off. You can, you can make it as long as you want or, or as small as you want, but seven to ten days is a good day. Sometimes, um, with I know with Sandy, when it happens, a lot of, I know in the city, like the trains were shut off, so most people weren't going to work, so they were home. Um, so you want to make sure that you have enough uh, sustainment to last you for this amount of time. And you want to know what's important to you and your family. So know what kind of foods your kids like, what kind of foods your, your spouse likes, what kind of foods you like. Um, and you want to prepare a smaller go kit, which is like a, a book bag or a duffel bag that's specific to your needs so that you can quickly take it and go in case you need to evacuate. And on this website, which is also on the Z cards we gave you, the little blue cards, you can find out more information on all of this. So you want to stock up on your first aid kit. You want to have, you know, the minimum here, some ace bandages, uh, cold packs, band-aids, just things that will get you through if you have any, like, you know, nicks, cuts, scratches. Um, protective supplies, you know, uh, work gloves, eye goggles, um, closed toe footwear. I point that out a lot because if there's a flood or everything's flooded around you, you don't want to be walking around in murky water that you can't see through in flip-flops or close, you know, open toe shoes uh, and then you get a further injury. So closed toe footwear is important, whether sneakers or boots, I recommend boots. And then you want to have a whistle. I say a whistle because, I know, it's like, why would I want a whistle? A whistle, if for some reason you're trapped or you're, you're stuck somewhere, you can't be found and nobody can hear you, screaming is going to dehydrate you after a good, you know, 20 minutes. Like, already I've been speaking for 15 minutes and I'm like, okay, I need some water. But uh, screaming is going to dehydrate you even further and you might lose your voice. A whistle, you can blow a whistle for hours. So you just want to keep blowing a whistle. So always have that, that's, that's a good uh, plan. Sustainment, this is where it's important. You want to have your energy bars now are pretty good. Uh, you want to have your canned foods. Make sure it's canned foods that you like. Don't just go to the supermarket and get, and get what's on sale. Make sure it's something that you and your family will enjoy eating. And a manual can opener, okay? An electrical can opener, I know it looks cool and it's fancy, but it won't work if the lights are off. If the electricity is gone, you're not going to be able to open any of your food. So always have a manual can opener and then heating utensils. Now, check the expiration dates for these things because they do expire. So you want to be able to restock and replenish your stuff um, as, as the time goes on. And drinking water supply. Water is very important. You can last, I know it's uh, like seven days without food. Um, we've been longer, some people. Um, but you can only last theoretically three days without water. So you'll dehydrate from water faster than it is from eating. So just make sure that you have enough drink fresh water supply for yourself and for your family. And what we recommend is about 2.5 or let's say three cases of water per person per day, or per person in general. And then, or one gallon of water per person per day. So times 10 days, you're looking at 10 gallons of water, which sounds like a lot, but if you just get the cases of water, what, what I recommend to people is, you know, every time you go to the pharmacy or you go to the supermarket, 
they have those 24 packs on sale all the time. So sometimes it's like, oh, 199 for a 24 pack of pollen spray. Cool, grab one and just put it in your pantry or just put it somewhere and stock it up. And then every time, you, every few times that you go, just you know, purchase a few more. And before you know it, you'll have cases, like at least 10 cases of water. So you'll know you'll be set for your water supply. Hygiene. Uh, stocking up on your hygiene material, your toothpaste, toothbrushes, um, garbage bags, because you know you don't know what you're gonna accrue in the time that you can't leave your house. You accrue a lot of garbage, so just make sure you have those big, heavy-duty black bags that you can toss all your garbage in there. Toilet paper, prescription supplies. Always have extra su uh, prescription supplies on you, especially during an event like this. You want to have at least 10 days. Um, so letting that's why planning now um, is so important because you don't want to wait till the day before something happens to call your doctor and be like, hey, I need a prescription for X, Y, Z, and they're like, well, I can't give that to you. So just make sure that you're preparing ahead of time. Tools, cell phone chargers, LED lanterns, flashlights are important, um, duct tape, and then paper, pencils, permanent markers, keeping that because you want to be able to write stuff down later on, and she'll talk about that um, shortly. And then a document holder. I actually like this part because a lot of times people don't keep all their docu important documents in one location. So a document holder, preferably one that you can make waterproof if it's like a Ziploc bag or something. Um, make, put all your important documents, passports, uh, birth certificates, copies of these things, social security card, uh, cash and banking information. You want to have all of this in one central location because if you, let's say, it's a fire and you need to leave or you can just go and grab this document holder and you know you have all your important, you and your family's important paperwork. If you have a passport here, a social security card there, a birth certificate here, you're going to be like scrambling to get these things. So having them all in one central location makes it so much easier to be able to just take and go. So having that and having copies of all these things because trust me, it's much easier so make sure everything's all together and have to pay $135 for a new passport because, you know, you got destroyed. And the kit that I was mentioning before, you want to customize it to fit your individual needs. So if you have infants in the house, if you have small children, if you have elderly uh, adults, if you have people with disabilities or special needs, you want to consider that. And you want to also have a special kit for your pets. If anybody have pets? Okay. okay. So cats, dogs, you know, ferret, whatever you have. Um, just make sure. She says that if she has. I just I, I have a ferret. So um, now I have to think about what I'm gonna bring if I need to ever evacuate. Um, so include that when it comes to evacuating and sheltering. So a typical pet kit obviously has your food, bottle of water so they can drink, medications if they need any, cat litter pan, etc. Uh, but a big one is your vet records and immunization records. Most shelters, um, some of them will, some, some of them will say they will take your dogs or their cats, uh, but they won't take them if you don't have any of your vet or immunization records, because they have no way of showing or proving that they're all up on their shots or, or they're all up on everything that they need. So make sure you have in your document holder. I would also put in those vet records and immunization records so that they know that your dog or cat or whatever you have is okay. And we ask you to please don't leave your pet behind. There's been videos, there's been stories of people who, uh, there was a video during Hurricane Katrina a few, uh, 10 years ago, that um, there was like a German Shepherd on the roof of a house, because it was flood, obviously you saw the water completely cover this entire house, and they did a full military uh, mission, like Black Hawk and everything came down, repelled down, Save, risk their lives to save this dog that was left behind by their, because the dog was tied, I don't know how, what, what happened, but uh, I saw it on online, and these are real stories of people, and during Hurricane Sandy too, there was a lot of animals that were left behind. So we ask that you take your pet behind, because after all, they are part of your family. And what do I need to take if I need to evacuate? That's where your go kit is. It's your book bag or your duffel bag, something portable you can take with you. Just make sure you have something um, with you. It's a smaller version of your emergency supply, so it's not like all your 12 cases of water. It's like two or three, four bottles of water, if that. Um, it's just to get you from point A to point B. Usually in point B, if it's a shelter, they'll have water for you and things of that nature, but just make sure you have a small version of your emergency supply, some extra clothes, 
and try to keep it as lightweight and portable as possible. So in the Level Z cards we gave you, we have this um, list that's in there as well. Uh, you want to have, you know, water, your small first aid kit, flashlights. A big one though that I do recommend is small quantity, quantities of cash because at that time ATMs might not be working, um, stores might not be accepting credit or debit, so you want to have cash on hand so that you can buy that bottle of water or you can buy this or that. So that's a big one if you get anything out of this whole list is that small quantity of cash. Okay. And a, a best practice that we suggest is once your emergency supplies and go kit is put together, you've got everything that you need, just make sure that you identify what's perishable, what, what needs to be replace soon, check expiration dates, and just keep re replenishing things so you have the freshest things in there. And if you do have to take something out of there and use it, just make sure you replace it um, as you go. And learning basic first aid. Nobody here needs to be a licensed physician, but what we do ask you is just to know, just to know a few basic things like what to do in case of an emergency, uh, how to care for a person calling for help um, if needed, and just learning how to stop bleeding. Based, um, that's one of the biggest things that can save somebody's life, so manual pressure or knowing how to put a dressing on is very important. And learn how to respond to these common first aid issues like cuts, um, bruises, heat injuries, cold injuries. And um, life-threatening situations, they're as easy as A, B, C, D. We break it down into this acronym of airway. You want to make sure that the person's airway is not blocked so that there's nothing lodged in their throat. Uh, breathing, make sure they are breathing, you can see proper rise and fall of the chest, circulation, heart is beating, it's pretty much, so making sure, and CPR, if you, anybody who's interested in taking CPR classes, you can take uh, CPR and AD classes online, um, you can look up, there's, um, they're offered all over the state, and you can just see the Red Cross, there's a lot of these great classes, and they're fairly inexpensive, and you can get a great, great uh, day out of it, just learning all this great information. And defibrillation, just how to use an AED machine to get your heart to start beating again if it stops. So just remember ABCD when it comes to life-threatening situations. And um, we're not going to do a 10 minute break, this is just on here. But part two is respond and recover, and the 10 dose is going to cover this fairly quickly. So thank you so much, and the 10 dose will be So this. after we prepare, we have to know how to respond and recover. So guess who's the first responder? You are, and you need to be prepared for this. Um, you pretty much have two choices, you can shelter in place, or you can evacuate to the plan that Lieutenant Alvarez talked about, go somewhere else. If you shelter in place, always make sure you check on your neighbors. You don't know who really needs extra help and who really is stuck, or just, just make sure you check on your neighbors. Of course, check on your family and anyone near you. Um, maintain communications with authorities is important because you don't know if you stay in place, you need to go somewhere or you need to evacuate. So make sure you keep some type of contact with authorities. And if, you're, if you are gonna shelter in place, make sure your generators or anything electrical or space heaters, anything is properly ventilated. You don't wanna end up with another type of emergency. Okay, so if you shelter in place, um, let someone know, let that cousin or friend or anyone who you, you, who you're going to call and let someone from far, someone that's not in the same neighborhood that may actually end up in the same emergency, let someone from far know that you're there and you're staying there. Um, shut up all your utilities depending on the emergency, if it's a hurricane or if it's a man-made disaster, just know what type of emergency it is and what utility you need to shut off. And again, make sure you're keeping an eye and an ear out for any alert systems, your cell phones, uh, alarms in your local neighborhood or anything like that. Um, now, why is there sometimes a bowl of water or water? 99.9999% is usually because they have found some type of uh, organism in when they tested and this could cause an illness. So they, they highly, highly recommend if there is an alert that you pay attention and you boil your water. Um, this, this could again lead to many other complications later on. 
So if there's a water boil, uh, if there's a bowl water order, um, strain your water through with cheesecloth. I don't know if anyone has that at their home. I know for sure I don't make tea, so. But, <laughs> or I drink coffee, so I definitely don't have coffee filters either. But I mean, boil your water. If they recommend for you to boil your water for a minimum of two minutes, I, I personally feel that two minutes is just way too little. I, I say, you know, let it boil for a little longer. And then don't drink the water when it's hot. Make sure it like sets and it cools off. Um, if there is a bowl water order, pretty much what this is telling you, don't use it for absolutely anything unless you're using it for like the toilet. But if it's to wash vegetables or you know to cook, to wash your hands or anything like that, make sure it's boiled. Because if you think about it, if you don't boil your water, you wash your hands, you rinse your hands, you could somehow end up putting your fingers in your mouth, in your eyes, and then you could still end up with whatever is in the water. Um, now we're going to talk about what about if I'm trapped. If you're in a situation where you're trapped, try to see if you can reach your cell phone, you can reach your cell phone, have some type of way of contacting someone. Dial a friend. Um, if you, what's, uh, the next thing you have to think about, what's, how are you trapped? Is something on top of you? Are you trapped because the door is blocked? But you don't want to start screaming and dehydrating yourself because you're just going to tie yourself out. So if you're able to make a phone call, call someone, let them know. If you have that whistle, start just blowing away and try and see if someone can hear you. But whatever it is, just be very careful. Okay, so I don't know if anyone's played this game. I know this is definitely a lot of fun, but it's just like the game um, Jenga. You have to be careful because if, if you're trapped and if something is on top of you and you move any of this piece or concrete, whatever's trapping you, you could end up in a worse situation. So again, if, you, if you're able to reach out for your phone, the whistle, go ahead and do that. Now, what about if someone else is trapped? Now, can you see them? Can you see what, what type of emergency they're having? What's on top of them? What's, what's tracking them? You wanna make sure that they're still conscious. Um, and you don't wanna end up moving anything, and again, more things collapsing, and you end up being trapped as well, because then no one's gonna help each other. So always, I know you want to help, but also be very diligent on how you're going to do it. Okay, um, now this is where it's, I mean, if someone is trapped and, and, and you see them, you want to make that smart decision on how you're going to help them. Because also remember, you don't want to end up there too, and now it's two people that need to be rescued instead of one. And you could at least walk away and try to get someone to come and help them instead of being trapped there with them. <clears throat> now, if you do evacuate, we always recommend to always let someone, let someone know what your plan is. Let someone know that you either stay in shelter or that you're evacuating. If you, let, if you do evacuate, let someone know where you're evacuating to. So they, someone can have some type of accountability for you and your family. Um, again, the plan that Lieutenant Alvarez talked about. If you're going to go far, um, make sure you, you take your go kid, make sure you evacuate with your pets, and make sure you leave everything off in your house. Turn all your utilities off, lock, um, lock all your doors, board it up if you can, and the whole pencil and paper that you need to also have in your emergency kit, and so you can also leave a note outside your door. Now the note is not going to be huge and big saying like, I'm not home, come in and you know, rob me, but something where the authorities or anyone who responds goes there, they can just quickly see that you're not home and they can move on to the next house because you don't know what type of emergency the next house is having. So just kind of a courtesy note for authorities. Again. I mentioned the go kit. If you do evacuate, make sure you take your go kit. That's pretty much should be a small mirror of the big emergency kit that you'll have in, at home if you do shelter at home. Um, 
again, notify someone and do not go back home until authorities give you the thumbs up, all right? Recover. Um, this is actually a very important one. Once the uh, authorities say that you're good to go back, again, let someone know, let someone know that you're going to go home. Why do you have to let someone know that you're going back home? Well, depending on the type of crisis, you don't know if your house is in good condition for you to go back home. So what happens if you go back home and you start moving things around and then you, the house ends up collapsing? Then you're going to have, if someone knows, then they, they can't find you. They can at least alert authorities. Um, do not turn the utility back on. Let a professional handle that. I know sometimes in a type of disaster, we try to save money. Uh, we try to save a dollar here and there, but we really end up spending a lot more money. So always call a professional and turn back your utilities. And if you see any damages, just it's better if you leave and you call your insurance and you let them know of anything that's going on. Um, make contact with your insurance company, but it's very important that you keep in mind that when you let your insurance company know, you also have to have everything, all the pictures, all, you, you need to be aware of what your insurance company covers because it's going to become one big battle. You're not going to be the only one calling your insurance, there's going to be many people and it's just going to create big conflict. So always keep a, the document damage, uh, a list of and, and pictures of everything in your house. Make a, if you do get to go inside, just make note of what's damaged or not, so when you call them. And check for any disaster system programs that can help you out. And most important out of all this, be very careful with any scams. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of companies that try to scam all the survivors, sometimes it could be insurance companies, sometimes it could be the contractors that you hire to fix your house. So just be aware of any of that. And if you feel like you're being scammed, let someone know. Call someone that can help you. And just have them checked out before you end up in a worse situation. Okay, so warning again. Never attempt to turn on any gas, electric, or water connections until inspected by all professionals. This is very important. Let's not try to be a hero and turn stuff on that we're not experts on. And this is, again, important. Emotional needs. Sometimes we forget that not only does our house have to go back up, that we need to fix all of our property and all the everything we need for our basic needs, but our emotions is also part of our basic needs. So if you feel in any way that mentally stressed, if you're physically feeling way too worn out, you should definitely seek help, try to get some rest, talk to someone that you feel that can help you. It could be a professional, it could be at your church. Just seek for help and don't don't feel that you know you need to be that better person. It, it's it's happening to everyone, and you want to provide a better home for your family. So you have to start with within yourself. Um, if you feel any anxiety or confusion, it's gonna be it's gonna be normal. It, tragedies really affect us. So just again, be aware of that and be aware of your neighbors, your family, if they're going through that too. Um, again, just not only you, you ha I know you'll take care of your family first, but don't forget about your emotional needs as well. And this is the circle of life. So it's you and your family, of course, take care of yourself, take care of your family immediately, but then offer a hand to your neighbors, see you know, what your neighbors need and how you can assist them. And then after you're done helping your neighbors, see how you can help around the communities. Um, if we have a nurse here, if we have a plumber or an electrician, you could go and help that neighbor, help the community to just bring it back up. So let's start with the family and then we move out and we'll be successful. Now, if anyone 
would like to volunteer after any of the disasters, or even now, and this is um, for trade, like for te technical or trade person, for plumbers, for electricians. Um, you can join the Civilian Emergency Response Corps, and again, you don't need to be certified or anything, but they can definitely use an extra hand. And if you have any more questions or you would like more information, the website is at the bottom, and you can always sign up right there. And for more information about our presentation, you can also visit us at prepare.newyork.gov, and the floor is open for any questions. Thank you for coming. Thank you. The website's also on the little cards that we gave out. So there's also some more great information. There's videos on there as well um, that you can contact. And also um, every every area of Suffolk, I think Nassau, they have their own uh, emergency management office. So you can also get some great information from them. But if anybody has any questions, um, we're more than glad to answer them. And if not, then enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you for coming. Yes? Question is, I, and I always wanted this service since I was little. When we get those emergency alerts or whatever mm -hmm. on our phones, electronics, whatever, do, do any of those emergency things, whatever, come on, if, if there be something nuclear, something that we're not watching the news mm -hmm. or whatever, something different, um, those kind of things, would that come on there? Yeah, so I don't know about, not, not with the wireless emergency alerts, not the, I don't think with like, no? your, if your wireless company would do that, but, um, if you go on that New York Alert, um, they have a, a myriad of options that you can choose to be alerted on. Uh, I don't know if nuclear they would give you, um, but that's on a bigger scale. scale, so I think that that would be more, like the news would notify you of that. There'd be definitely more right. broadcast on, on that. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. Any other questions? And this is great, like I said, we also, um, do this presentation, obviously, here at churches, uh, but schools, uh, community Library. centers, libraries. Uh, so if any of you know somebody that would benefit from this presentation, we gave you the card earlier. Um, just contact us, uh, reach us, and we're more than likely, we're more than happy to come. Uh, it's a completely free program. Um, and we also have it in different languages. Yes. So uh, not just English. Uh, we have Spanish. We've done uh, Creole. Creole. We've done Russian. Russian. I think Chinese, no, no, I have almost every language you think of. Um, but I hope you guys enjoy, uh, got a lot of out of this. Uh, it's very formative. I know it's a lot, but, um, you know, I even start to look at this differently when I go home. I'm like, oh, I, I have, you know, my own stuff set up. And, like, I, now I know, okay, we need to be proactive. Because the big thing, well, I didn't say it when I was presenting was the day, the two or three days before a storm, you go to the supermarket and it's the longest lines, there's no more water, the bread for some reason is the first thing that goes, there's no ever, never any bread because that's the first thing people go for. Um, so you want to avoid that and that's why having these things on hand, obviously not bread because it goes bad by like six months in advance, but having other things, especially the water because that's the first thing that goes. Um, having it so that you're not scrambling to go to the nearest supermarket. Um, so quick story, so not to cut you off, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I don't know if everyone remembers in, in Columbia, South Carolina, the floods and how, I mean, South Carolina was really hit with like bad storms. So I had to drive down there and I was there for training and I got there in the middle of the storm and I was in Fort Jackson. Well, there was no water in Fort Jackson. There was no light. Light went off. We had a blackout for like a day or two, but we didn't have water for like four or five days. This is a military like base, right? So we, we were there for school and we had to scramble for water to use to shower, for the bathroom, to drink. The, the water, we couldn't use the water. The schoolhouse was closed for like almost two weeks because we, they didn't have water to provide because there was no water around anywhere and there was a lot of, I mean, there was roads that were broken. It was just a terrible situation. So the schoolhouse couldn't open because there was no water to provide for the students for bathrooms to wash their hands for anything. 
Um, we couldn't, you know, exercise in the morning because there was not enough water that they could provide for us. And at this point, they couldn't even provide for us. We had to go out and search for our own water. And it, it's, it's pretty bad. I mean, the locals had time to prepare for that, for, but for the ones that were coming from different states, we just thought it was going to be one, you know, it was going to be low rain, yeah, maybe it was going to rain a lot, hard at times, but not where, like, we were going to be, like, out for, like, two weeks, so. Yeah, flooding, I think, is is one of the biggest things that can affect all of us, especially here um, out of the island, and people don't really realize how prevalent it is, um, and something just as simple as that can pretty much put you off for, for weeks, so having these emergency supplies starting from now, uh, it's great, especially now we're, that we're kicking into the summer, hopefully. It's cold to go away, but uh, now that we're rubbing into the, like, you know, storm season, uh, you want to have all this prepared. And, it, and it's very easy. It just, just takes a few few minutes out of your, you know, weekend if you go to the store and just pick up some extra supplies. So um, I'm glad that you guys came out uh, and spent some time with us on this Sunday. So thank you. And if there's no more questions, then if Mr. Lou has any anything else for them, then that's it for us, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.